All right, every, every year, my uh, brother and my sister-in-law, uh, they rent a beach house for the whole family to vacation at during the summer. They, they pay for the house, and the rest of us, we just uh, bring the food and, like, the supplies. And in my case, I just bring the good vibes, all right? So it's, it's a pretty good deal, if I say uh, the least. It's a good deal, even if I have to hang out with my in-laws for the week. Hopefully, they're not going to watch this. Now, one summer, my brother-in-law, Theo, he had the best idea that I think he may have ever have had in his life. He decided that we needed to go deep sea fishing. And I was like, yes. Yes, we do. And as a man who grew up on Lake Superior uh, in the northern part of Michigan, who loves the water, I was all in on this idea of going deep sea fishing. I was pumped. I was excited. So the day came. I had on my new fishing shirt. I had my, my fishing hat and my SPF like a thousand <laughs> because my red beard and freckles and Casper, the friendly ghost skin, uh, were not about to get sunburned and have this experience ruined for me. So Theo, my uh, uh, my brother-in-law, my, my nephew, Simeon, and myself, uh, we got to the boat, and we met our captain, and this was him, Captain Larry. This, 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 this isn't really Captain Larry, but this is, what captain, this is what Captain Larry looked like, a man amongst men, a man of the sea, Captain Larry, just sitting there, glaring out by his boat. Man, what a man, right? What a man, right? Yeah. My man, now we go back to him every year, so we're basically best friends. Every year I say, Captain Larry, it's so good to see you again. And he's like, who are you? Get away from me. (laughs) But this was our first time on the boat. And before we we pulled up the anchor and went out to the deep sea, Captain Larry here, he said he had some things he needed to go over with us, important things. And I thought, all right, this is where Captain Larry is going to tell us how to catch the biggest fish. Right, this is how Captain Larry, he's going he's gonna to give us all his secrets, all the best information about deep sea fishing and how to, how to be a man like that, like himself. He's going to tell us about the special bait that he has for us that we can catch jaws with, or, or he's going to tell us what to do when the marlin jumps over the boat. Right, this was going to be where we learned how to be the world's best deep sea fishermen there ever were. Because obviously, Captain Larry knew all the tricks, right? Just look at him, right? right? So he, he stands up, the real Captain Larry, he stands up in front of us. He has a fishing pole in his hand, and he says these words, words that I'll never forget. This is your fishing pole. Do not throw it into the sea. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Theo and I, we just stared at him thinking, that's all you got for us? Like, where's the big speech, the, the soliloquy, the, the, the motivation? Where's the secrets? And I think that really have, would have been it. Just, you know, this is your fishing pole. Don't throw it in the sea. But my nephew, Simeon, he had the audacity to ask Captain Larry, well, what happens if I throw the fishing pole into the sea? And without hesitation, without missing a beat, Captain Larry said, I will throw you in after it. <laughs> so that was it. That was it. That was our big pep talk. That was, that was our, our big woohoo moment. Right? This is your fishing pole. I value it more than your life, <laughs> was basically the speech. But I guess that really is the most important thing about going deep sea fishing. Don't lose the fishing pole. Right? Don't, don't lose the fishing pole. What, what could be more important than that? What could be more fundamental more basic than, this is your fishing pole. <laughs> this is your fishing pole. It reminds me of a story I once heard about Vince Lombardi, and I, I know this is two weeks in a row talking about Vince Lombardi. <laughs> I don't usually do this, uh, but he has some really good stuff, and there's a couple new biographies out about him. <laughs> All right. And when Captain Larry said, this is your fishing pole, it reminded me of how the famous football coach of the Green Bay Packers, Vince Lombardi, used to start the first practice of every season that he coached. He he would stand before his team, these grown men, these professional football players, guys who made the sport of football their entire life and profession. He would stand before them, and we, we we would laugh to think of what he says. He says this, Men, 
this is a football. <laughs> and he stands there, he just holds it. Man, this, this is a football. That's, that's how he started the first practice of every year. And we laugh. At, well, that's stupid. Shouldn't they know what a football is by this point? Well, shouldn't, shouldn't people who hire a deep sea captain to take them fishing know what a fishing pole is? Yes, they should, and that's the point. All right, take, take a look at this, Foundry Church. Professionals should know the basics of their profession better than anyone else in this world, right? right? Well, they should know the basics better than anyone else in this world. Professional football players should be able to tell you everything there is to know about a football and why it's important in their position, in their particular position, and in the unique ways that they can interact with the football, whether they're a defensive player, a special teams player, or an offensive player. I heck, they should know how many stitches are, are down the center of the ball, how, how many seams are on it, how much air should, have, should be in the football, unless you're a former quarterback for the Patriots. <laughs> right? Captain Larry, professional fisherman, should know what kind of line goes on the fishing poles and how long the line should be and what kind of bait to use on what kind of hook to get a, a specific kind of fish into the boat. Professionals are the best at the basics. They know the basics. There is no one better at the basics than those who have made something their life's work. Right? And in turn, those people also know when they are struggling with the basics, don't they? When, when things go awry, when, when things go amiss. Now, my wife and I are, you guys know, this is no secret, but apparently we're 90 years old. <laughs> right? I, uh, a night out for us is, what do you want to order on Uber Eats? And what do you want to watch on TV? And one of the things that we do uh, for our our date time, it was, we watched 60 Minutes, right, on Sunday nights, or we, we, we watch, I was going to say we record it, but you don't actually do that anymore, you stream it, see, we're old, all right, now this is, this is, there's almost always on 60 Minutes a story that one of us can relate to, a story that we can either argue about, or just a story that gets us talking for the evening, a while back there was an episode that had a story about Peyton and Eli Manning, now, I love the Manning family. It is fascinating to me from one family can come such, uh, so much success in one sport. And beyond that, they seem to genuinely uh, like each other and enjoy each other's company. And besides that, they don't even look like professional athletes. <laughs> right? It's just a remarkable family. And so when this story came on, I actually put down my phone and I watched this story. And the story was not just about the Manning brothers. It was also about another man named David Cutcliffe, or Coach Cut, as the Manning brothers called him. Coach Cut was, was Peyton Manning's quarterback coach at the University of Tennessee, and they always stayed close. And when Coach Cut went to the University of Mississippi, Eli took note of that, and he decided to play at that school for Coach Cut. Now, if you ask either brother today, they will say that Coach Cut always has been and always will be their coach. Coach Cut is their coach. He, he was, was there as they were coming up, coming up and, and, and he, he taught them the most important skills of being a quarterback. He taught them the basics of, of throwing and of the quarterback position. And when, when both brothers, both of the Manning brothers started to struggle at the end of their careers, one of them because of injury and well, the other, we don't really know what happened. There's a lot going on with Eli. But they reached out to their coach. And if you asked Coach Cut what was the problem with their careers, with both of them at that point, he would say that they had the same problem. They had forgotten the basics of throwing a football. They, they forgot the basics. For instance, in 2012, when Peyton Manning was cut from the Colts with a serious neck injury, Coach Cut watched film of Peyton throwing the ball and said, your mechanics are all wrong. You're going to blow out your arm. You forgot the basics. So Coach Cut spent the next two years reconstructing Peyton, the quarterback, by taking him back to the basics, teaching him the basics. 
Eli Manning had a rough season in 2013, and in the same way, he allowed his coach, Coach Cut, to carve him up and to rebuild him with the basics, with a solid foundation. Right? Why would these two premier athletes allow their, their old coach to tear apart their technique and reconstruct their game? Why would they allow that? It's because both Peyton and Eli know that a return to the basics right, isn't a sign of failure. It's not a sign of failure. Returning uh, to the, the basics is the best way to succeed at whatever you're doing. It, it's the basics. And you got to be good at the basics. And, and church, foundry, our faith, our faith is no different. Right? Our, our forging a relationship, a lifelong relationship with God is no different. Right? No matter where we are on that journey. Right, if we've been doing it for a long time or if we're just trying to figure out who Jesus is, our faith is no different. If we want to become uh, the pros, if we want to be the pros, if we want to be forged men and, and forged women and forged students, we're going to have to get back to the basics and maybe learn about the basics for the very first time. Right, I think we need someone to stand up here with a fishing pole and say, Foundry, this is your fishing pole, don't throw it overboard, right? Or, or maybe I need to stand up here and say, right, this is the cross, right? Listen, last week, we celebrated Easter, right? The, the cornerstone of our faith, the reason we do everything that we do around here, the central moment in the good news of the gospel, the central moment. But if someone came up to you right now and asked you what the gospel uh, is, what is the gospel? What would you say? Would you be able to answer? And, and before you look away and, and hide, if you don't know the answer, you are in the exact right place. You know, my dad always tells this story of that when um, he was growing up and when he was in college and he was trying to figure out this faith thing and who Jesus is, he didn't grow up in the church he said he would go to different churches and all they did was talk about sin. They would say things about how we all have sinned or, or how we're all rotten and sin causes that and, and sin does this and sin does that and sinners are going to burn in hell and blah, 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 blah. And so he finally, he just asked someone, what is this sin thing that you keep talking about? Like, what is it? I don't know what it is. And so I think sometimes us church people, we throw around words like the gospel and the good news and sin. And we think everyone will just got to get on board and pick it up where we, uh, as we go. But as your pastor, as your, as your coach, I'm not doing a very good job if I never teach you the basics, uh, if I never show you what the football is, right? You see, church, if we don't know what God is for or or who he is, or why we even celebrate Easter, then we most certainly won't know how to forge our life on him. And before some of you check out and say, well, I already got this. I'm, I'm already a professional, right? Some of you are, are already checking out thinking, man, I got this gospel thing down. In fact, I'm way past this gospel thing. I'm, I'm an advanced Christian. I'm, a, I'm on the uh, what book of the Bible should I memorize first type <laughs> Christian, Right, that's my level of faith, or, or, or the, the which level of hell should I start charging in with a squirt gun at? Right? If you're thinking, that's me, right? If that's what you're thinking, I would say, well, aren't you special? <laughs> right? Well, what's it like up in your ivory tower? I mean, Paul, the apostle Paul himself said this in 1 Corinthians, for I have decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all he wanted to know. That's all he knew, right? That was the basics, the foundation. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Listen, church, whether this is your first Sunday here or you're just trying to figure out who this Jesus character is or you've been going to church your whole life, there is no graduation from the gospel. All right? it's, it's not just a, a thing we get and then move on to other things. 
It's the pool of which we live in, we swim in, we dive in. It is the thing we should know, the thing we should believe in, the thing we should forge our life on. It is the fundamental of all things that matter in this life and in the next. It's the basic building block of all strength, all victory, all hope, and all joy. And when it comes to this fundamental thing, this basic thing, it's not something that we, we just graduate from. The gospel is not something that we move on from. It is something that we move deeper and deeper and deeper into. Tim Keller, pastor, author in New York City, once said it like this. The gospel is not the ABCs of the Christian life. It is the A to Z of the Christian life. Right? It's everything. All right, so for the next couple of weeks, I want us to break down this gospel thing down to its core, this, this good news and figure out what is the big deal. Right? You think, uh, why is this so important? Right? We're going to do that together, and then we're going we're gonna to get this foundation, we're going to understand this foundation, and then we're going we're gonna to jump back into some of the elephant in the room topics, hard conversations about the church and the faith that, and the world that we live in with this, this foundation. Right? So are you willing to go back to the basics with me? And I, I think we're going to be surprised by what we find. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians is in your second half of your Bible. It's a letter. Right? That's 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. They're both letters that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church uh, because they were weird. <laughs> right? And they needed a strongly worded letter. <laughs> we're going to be in 1 Corinthians. And as you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of context if you don't have a Bible, please take the Bibles that are in the seats in front of you, and you can take those with you. They're for you to have to give away to use. Uh, the book of 1 Corinthians was written by Paul, like I said, as a letter to the church in the city of Corinth. And, and let me tell you this, this church was a mess. All right? it, was, it was a mess. They were divided politically. All right? They were suing each other in court. Right, openly fighting, right? And in a turn of events that no one saw coming, they were getting drunk on communion and having orgies in the church. It's a crazy church. Right? It's one evangelistic strategy, but I don't think that's where God wants us, right? That's not what he wants us to do. So Paul hears about this, and he writes this letter, a strongly worded letter. Right? And the theme of the letter is basically this. right? This, this is what you can sum this up with. Right? Just, just, I'm not, it's not on the screen. But this is the theme of the letter. Get it together. <laughs> right? Get it together, Corinthians. Right? Get it together. And he talks to them all about all sorts of things. But near the end of the book, he reminds them of the basics of their faith. So read with me today, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 5. Let me turn there. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. Right, if we call Christ our Savior, if he's our Lord, if he's our Savior, right, we have received that gospel, that good news, by, by hearing it, believing it, confessing Jesus to be Lord, right, repenting of our sins and being baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of those sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right? So he's saying, he's saying, now I will remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, right, which you're forging your life on, and by which you're being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain... Unless you didn't really believe, right? For I delivered to you as the first importance, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in, according, in accordance with the Scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Now, all right, Paul, all right, just keep your finger there, Paul is, is standing before the church in Corinth with a flashing neon sign that says, hey, remember the basics. Get it together. Remember the thing that turned it all around for you. 
Remember the thing that you're supposed to be forging your life on. Remember the good news, the gospel. And then he sums up the gospel for us in a nice, neat, and pretty package for us. And since preachers are not innovators, we're just really good at repeating things. I want to use Paul's summary of the gospel for us to get back to the basics. So let's read it again. All right, I'm going to start in the second half of verse 3. Right, and it says this. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. All right. So how does it begin? What is the first word there? Christ. All right? When he summarizes, when, when he takes us back to the basics, it's Christ. Right? It's the word Christ. Now, stop right there. I know it's just one word, and I know you're scared because you're thinking, Andrew, you just got the one word, and you're stopping. <laughs> Don't worry. Right? So all I'm going to talk about today is this one word. Right? But Because it's by far the most important word. And sometimes we just, we just kind of jump right over it. We kind of just gloss right over it. Some of you are looking at me like, what's the big deal? Right? Christ is just Jesus' last name, right? And some of you are like, hey, my mom, she told me that, and she used to yell it at me and with his middle initial, too. <laughs> right? Right? But church, let me be clear, right? Christ is not Jesus' last name, and he doesn't have a middle initial of age. Right? The gospel is not the good news of a man living down the road. Right? First name Jesus, last name Christ. That's not, that's not what it is. Right? Christ is much more than that. Christ is a title, right? right? Look at this, right? Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which means anointed one, right? So it's Jesus, Jesus, the anointed one. In the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings were anointed to show that they were set aside and devoted to a special purpose. And then a man named David King David was anointed to be the chosen king of God's people. Then once David took the throne, once he became king, because he was the anointed one, right? The, the chosen one, which Messiah means, right? right? Which, which, which David takes the throne, God made a promise to him that there would one day be a king from David's lineage that would reign forever and ever and over all things a new anointed one, a universal king, the Christ, the anointed one, the king, the ultimate. Right? You see, to G treat Jesus and Christ as equivalent, equivalent can't say it, right? to, to, to treat them just as names, first or second name, or just as different, different ways of of naming Jesus, that's, a, that's a, a leaving out a huge, huge part of the gospel. Right? To pass over the word Christ is to take the king out of our gospel. Right? And if we, if we look throughout the rest of scripture, the gospel is most frequently summed up with four words. Right? Jesus is the Christ. A lot of times we think Jesus died for me would be the four words, right? Right? I mean, that's Good Friday, Easter, or Jesus left the tomb, four words. But it's this. It's Jesus is the Christ, is the summary that we see in the Old Testament. Look, look at these next slides. Acts chapter 5, verse 42, when they're preaching, right, they're giving a summary of the gospel. Every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching the Christ, right, the, the anointed one, the king, is Jesus. Look at the next slide. Right? Now those who were scattered went about teaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ, the king, the anointed one. Right? Look at this one. Right? Acts chapter 9, verse 22. Yet Saul baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ, the king. Because he's the anointed one, and you don't anoint Jimmy down the road, you anoint the king. 
All right, look at this next one. Acts chapter 18, verse 28. By the scriptures, Apollos showed the, the Christ, the king, to be Jesus, this man. That's crazy. Right? We could go on and on through the letters and through the books that chronicle the New Testament, the church. Right? We could go on and on. But over and over again, the summary, what the church was spreading, the good news that they were teaching, the gospel that they were preaching was this. Jesus is the Christ. That's where it starts. Like I said, a lot of times we say, you know, Jesus died for me, or, or the tomb is empty. Right? But it doesn't start there. It starts that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the king. The most basic and fundamental building block of the gospel is that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the king. He is the Christ. He's the anointed one, the king of kings. And notice I didn't say Jesus is a king. Right? The gospel starts with Jesus is the king. The king, the high king. He's the king that is like no other before him, and, and no king will, will ever come close to him. When Jesus begins his ministry, and he declares what kind of king he has been anointed uh, to be, in Luke chapter 4, he says this. All right, so when he, when he declares his ministry, when he says, this is who I am, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, right, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Right? He's the king, a different kind of king. Right? Jesus would be a king for the poor. He would be a king for the captives, both physically and spiritually, for the blind, both physically and spiritually. He would be radically for the down and out. He would be different. King Jesus is not a selfish king. He's a, a self-sacrificing king. He's not a mean king, but a kind king. He is not an insecure, cowardly Prince John who opposed Robin Hood type of king, but a generous King Richard, a king for those for whose return his subjects longed for. He, he's not like Scar in The Lion King. He's Mufasa. Right? He, he's not the white witch in Narnia. He's Aslan. Right? You, you get what I'm saying. Right? Jesus is the king. And why is this so important? Right? Why? You know, some of you are thinking, huh? Even Christina this week when I was talking to her, she's like, why are you going to do a whole sermon about Jesus as king? All right? All right, and you might be thinking, eh, that's cool. Yeah, Jesus is king. What's the big deal? It's this. Our forgiveness, it's not possible without his kingship. <laughs> right, we, we can't be forgiven. We can't have eternal life if Jesus isn't king. Right, and no matter how successful someone is, Right, even Jesus, he lived a perfect life, but if he wasn't king, if he wasn't the anointed one, everything's in vain. Every, no, nothing matters. Right? So our forgiveness is not possible without his kingship. Let, let's go back to the summary verse in, in 1 Corinthians. How did it start? Christ died for our sins. Right, or another way that we might say it, or it might be, is that the king, right, Christ, the anointed one, the king died for our sins. The king did. Think about that. The, the king laid his life down for you. Now, we've watched all the movies, right? King Arthur, I don't know, Braveheart. He's not a king, right? But... The king died for you, right? Paul, Paul does not even mention the name of Jesus here. He says Christ. <laughs> the king died for our sins. Forgiveness flows through his kingship, right? Because he can offer forgiveness because he sits on the throne. He's the ruler. Forgiveness does not come through a person, but through a person in his official capacity as king. It is one thing to have a stranger die for you, but it's another thing entirely when the king dies for you. 
Right, you know, there's a, there's a story about Churchill uh, during World War II and the Allied invasion of Normandy on D-Day. The story goes that the British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, desperately wanted to join the expeditionary forces and watch the invasion from the bridge of a battleship in the English Channel. Like, he wanted to be right there during D-Day, he, right? which is hilarious if you've read anything about, about Winston Churchill. So U.S. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, for obvious reasons, thought this was a terrible idea. He's like, Churchill, you cannot do this. Like, don't go. It's too dangerous. You're being dumb, right? right? But Churchill, right, they didn't call him a bulldog for nothing. He says, all right, I'm going to do it. Doesn't matter. I'm going to go watch this invasion from the ship right there at the edge of the beach. And so Eisenhower, he knew he couldn't convince Churchill to stand down, to not do this stupid thing. And so Eisenhower appealed to a higher authority. He appealed to the king, to, to King George. The king went and told Churchill that if, the, that if it was the prime minister's duty, if it was his great duty to witness the invasion, he could only conclude that it was only his great duty as well to join him on the ship for the viewing of the, the, the invasion of D-Day. At this point, Churchill reluctantly agreed to back down because he knew that he could never expose the king of England to such danger. Right? Listen, in our world, we know that it is important to protect the king at all costs. Right? I know it's hard for our American minds, right? but, it, but that's, the, that's, the, that's the point, right? We have to protect the king at all costs. The, uh, this is the unspoken spoken premise of the game of chess. Right? When the king falls, the kingdom is lost and the game is over. It's just over. We've got to protect the king. That's what we think. And so as the band comes up, I, I really want you to grab this and, 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 and white knuckle it. Right? You know, when you hold something so tight, your knuckles turn white. Right? we got to get this. Right, Founder, our king is different. Our king is so different. Jesus the king is so different. In fact, he died for us. We, we have to protect him. He protected us. With royal courage, he surrendered his body to be crucified. On the cross, he offered a king's ransom, something that only the king, an anointed one sitting on a throne could do his life for the life of his people. Right? He, he, would, he would die for all the wrong things. Right? He would die for the things that we have, have done, the things that we will do, right? paying the price for all of our sins. It says in the Bible that to mock Jesus, they placed a crown of thorns on his head. But what was meant for mockery of his royal claims, actually proclaimed his kingly dignity even in death. It's who he was, a king, a different kind of king, the ultimate king. And I don't know about you, but having a king like that, forging my life on a king like that, sounds a lot better than anything that this world is offering up. Now, listen, I mean, get this, right? All right, get this. The world, right? and I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, you, I say be close to God, but also be close to people who are far from God, right? Don't live in a holy bubble, all right? But listen, listen, the world is full of stories about how to achieve full human success, Right? It just is. They're not openly called the Gospels. Right? You don't hear, hey, here's the Gospel of this or the Gospel of that. But our world, our lives, listen, our lives right here today, our, this week, our lives are filled with these, these Gospels, these counterfeit Gospels. Because they, they promise a fulfilled life. Right? So, so people, us, we start adopting them as, as our version of life's good news. Right, these, these fake gospels, they, they blend pop culture with, with spiritual sensibilities. And they will say things like, God wants you to be rich and healthy and attractive and in control. 
all right, they'll say things like, God desires you to be successful in whatever you do in your career as an athlete, as a student. Uh, they will always encourage you to, to go on some sort of journey of self-discovery. Right? You know what I'm talking about. We hear things that say, hey, find your true self. Right? Find your truth. Be who you feel inside. And that doesn't sound bad. And we should try to be healthy holistically. But listen, that's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. Because I don't know about you, but, but I'm not great at being the king of my own life. Uh, I'm not. I'm terrible at it, in fact. Just ask Christina. I mess up all the time. Right? I'm forever making the wrong choices, uh, saying the wrong thing, worrying about things that don't matter. I'm spending money on the wrong things at the wrong time. I'm, I'm, I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I get mad at people, especially in traffic. And if I go by what the world is telling me, well, then I just need to work harder at self-discovery, and those things won't happen anymore. Right? But that's not the gospel. Right? The, the, look, the gospel is not me focused, it is king focused. It's not Andrew's good news. Now, I, I'll be the first to tell you that when you give your life to Christ, you have a good life. Even if it might be difficult, but you're living a life that you were created to live. You're living a life of purpose, of meaning, of, of potential world-changing opportunities that there's benefit in it for you. But it's not your story. Because the gospel is king-focused. Right? The gospel reminds us that, that this world is not all about me. It's all about him. I know that's not popular to hear. Right? The gospel of King Jesus calls us to forgive our enemies because he did. But if I'm king, I don't want to forgive my enemies. Right? I, I, I want vengeance. Right? The gospel of King Jesus calls us to pray for those who persecute us because he did. The gospel of King Jesus calls us to serve everyone around us because he did. The gospel of King Jesus calls us to live sufficiently so we can give extravagantly because he did. The gospel of King Jesus calls us to care for the widows and the orphans because he did. The gospel of King Jesus calls us not to discover more about ourselves, but to deny ourselves and take up our cross because he did. Man. The gospel of King Jesus calls us to the goodness and the kindness and the gentleness and the faithfulness and the love and the joy and the peace and the patience and the self-control that is just unimaginable because that is who the king we serve is. That's the foundation of the gospel. This man, Jesus, is the Christ. He's the anointed one. He's the, he's the Messiah. He's the one that God chose from the very beginning of time to come into this world, to set aside his deity, right, to live a perfect life, sinless life, to go to the cross for us, yes, Come out of that grave three days later, right? It doesn't end there either, right? Because he, he walks around for, for 40 days. He's giving us a purpose, a commission, which we talked a lot about a lot this year at, at the Foundry, right? He's given us a purpose to go and make disciples and to do these things. And then he, he goes back and he, it says that he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father, Right, that's the gospel. It's still the gospel. It's king-focused. Our king is on the throne right now in heaven. Right? And then what it says, it says he was going to return again where he will rule in this new earth, in this new heaven for all of eternity with us. It's not just subjects that he rules over. 
for his children. Part of the family of God. That, that we're adopted as sons and daughters, princes and princesses in the kingdom of God because our king sits on a throne. Our king is the anointed one. And he's not a king that points and wags a finger at you and sends you to the gallows when you deserve it. He says, I'll go. I'll go. That's our king. Let's worship him. Let's continue to give him all honor and all thanks this morning.